Good morning and welcome to the meeting of the San Diego Metropolitan Transit Systems Budget Development Committee. I'm your chair, Vivian Moreno. Uh, clerk, will you please call the roll? Hi, good morning. Just a quick reminder to please turn on your microphones when speaking. Moreno? Present. Pilo Rivera? Present. Goble? Present. McCann? Absent. Whitburn? Here. Chair, we have a quorum. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and we're gonna move on to item number two, which is public comment. Clerk, are there any members of the public wishing to comment? We have no public comments. Thank you. Uh, item number three is the approval of the minutes for our meeting in November 2nd, 2023. Uh, Clerk, are there any members of the public wishing to comment on the minutes? We have no public comments. Okay, um, if I may have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I'll move. Thank you, Chair Whitburn. I'm happy to second. So um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Any abstention? And the motion passes unanimously with uh, Mayor McCann absent. Uh, we are going to move to item. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to move to item uh, the committee discussion, which is um, item number four. It is an informational item on the San Diego Transit Pension Plan. Um, I understand that we do have two separate presentations under this item, uh, but before we get to the presentation, uh, I will like to ask um, Larry Marinesi, our CFO. Um, I believe he has a few comments to make, so the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Council Member Moreno. Just wanted to open this. Um, you know, this has been a discussion um, item for uh, for some time, and we're here to uh, present. We have um, on the line. Uh, Liz Mason from uh, the firm of Hanson Bridget, who is going to do the first presentation of item number four, which relates to kind of the legal aspects of the pension plan and the opening of it. Um, and then the second half, we uh, welcome Ann Harper and Alice Alsberg from Chiron, and they're going to discuss uh, the cost impacts of, of reopening a, a pension plan. So with that, Liz, uh, I'll turn it over to you for your first part of this, uh, this item. Thanks, Larry, and thanks for that introduction. Um, thank you to the committee for having me. I'm glad to be here today, at least virtually. Um, as Larry said, I'm a partner in the Employee Benefits Practice Group at Hanson Bridget, uh, which is a California-based law firm. Uh, we have over 200 attorneys. We have a lot of experience working with public agencies on their retirement plans. And we also have a really large transit agency practice. So I am familiar with the types of issues that you all face and the decisions that you have to make in this area. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. If we could go to the next slide, please. So this is the agenda for my portion of the presentation. I'll provide some background on the current retirement plan structure for represented employees, and then go over the proposals that I reviewed um, regarding the changes to the current structure and summarize the legal issues associated with each of them. Of course, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along or at the end. You go to the next slide, please. So under the current retirement plan structure for San Diego Transit Corporation employees, there are three defined benefit pension plans, and these cover employees represented by ATU, by IBEW, and then the non-contract employees. The three plans are administered by a single retirement board and their assets are commingled for investment purposes. And throughout this presentation, I'm gonna to refer to this as the DB plan, uh, which is short for defined benefit plan. Back in uh, 2011 for the IBEW group and in 2012 for the ATU group, the parties um, agreed that the DB plan would be closed to newly hired employees in those groups going forward. In this presentation, I'm gonna to refer to these two groups together as represented employees. So as of 2011, 2012, um, in accordance with their respective collective bargaining agreements, newly hired represented employees participate in de a defined contribution plan, which is also called the 401A plan. So when you think of a defined contribution plan, think of like a 401K plan where there's a menu of available investment funds, mm -hmm and employees get to invest their account balances however they choose among those funds. And each employee's account balance is made up of the contributions that are made to their plan account, plus earnings on the investments that the employee elects. 
So currently, MTS contributes at the rate of 6% for empl of employees' compensation to the 401A plan for represented employees. Uh, employees are not required to contribute at all um, to this plan, but employees can make voluntary contributions to um, sort of a, a related plan, a different DC plan that's a 457B plan. And if they do, then MTS makes matching contributions to the 401A plan up to 2% of employees' compensation. So not long ago, the MTS board directed staff to evaluate some options for revising this current retirement plan structure for represented employees. And this presentation is part of the result of that process. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so working with staff, I analyzed a number of potential options for revising the current retirement plan structure for represented employees hired after 2011, 2012. Uh, these include contracting with CalPERS to provide a DB plan, establishing a new individually designed uh, DB plan, or reopening the existing DB pension plan for current employees and for new hires. And we looked at that sort of from two different angles. Um, the first, opening it prospectively only for both current employees and for new hires. And the second would be um, opening it both prospectively and retroactively with prior service credit for current employees. I provided a fairly lengthy memorandum that includes a detailed analysis of the legal issues associated um, with each of these options, and that's included in the agenda package. Um, I realize that not everyone has the time or the inclination to read a 10 plus page legal memorandum. So at the beginning of the memo, I included uh, like about a three page executive summary that's in the form of questions and answers regarding each of these options. Uh, and those questions and answers are incorporated into this presentation. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the first option that we looked at was contracting with CalPERS to provide retirement benefits, benefits for represented employees hired after 2011, 2012. This option isn't feasible because of the CalPERS contracting rules. CalPERS requires that local agencies contract with them to provide retirement benefits on a, a pretty much an all or nothing basis. Um, so for CalPERS contracting purposes, they only recognize two classifications of employees, safety employees, which means law enforcement and firefighters, and then non-safety, which is everybody else. Um, so if a local agency wants to contract with CalPERS to provide retirement benefits for any non-safety employees, then all non-safety employees would have to be covered by the CalPERS contract. So this means that all represented employees, as well as all non-contract employees, would have to be covered by the CalPERS contract CalPERS wouldn't allow a contract that covers only certain employees, for example, you know, bus operators, um, without covering all other non-safety employees. Um, next, we looked at whether a brand new defined benefit plan could be established for represented employees on a prospective basis. And this is a potential option. Um, we would need to make sure that the new DB plan complies with applicable tax rules to be a tax qualified plan, uh, just like the current DB plan does. Um, and the new plan would also need to comply with the California law known as the Public Employees Pension Reform Act or PEPRA, since PEPRA applies to all new DB plans that are established after January 1st of 2013. And we will talk more about what PEPRA compliance would require on the next slide. Um, I wanna point out first that compliance with PEPRA would be a change with respect to represented employees because the 401A DC plan that represented employees currently participate in was established before PEPRA took effect, meaning that it's not subject to PEPRA. So if a new DB plan were established, it would need to comply with PEPRA, which involves a number of things. Um, first, the Benefit formula required under PEPRA for a new DB plan is 2% at age 62. Uh, the parties could agree on a lower benefit formula, but any formula that's not 2% at 62 would have to be approved by the state legislature. And there are also limits under PEPRA on what can be treated as what's called pensionable compensation. Uh, and that includes both annual dollar limits and the types of pay items that can be counted towards pension benefits. Um, for example, uh, bonuses and overtime can't count towards pension benefits under PEPRA. Um, so one of the biggest changes for represented employees would be the mandatory employee contributions. Currently, represented employees aren't required to contribute to the 401A plan or to any retirement plan. 
employees can make voluntary contributions to the 457 DC plan and receive the employer match up to 2%, um, but that's not required. But the PEPPER rule is that employees have to contribute at least 50% of the so-called normal cost of benefits, uh, which is basically the amount that the plan actuary determines is required to fund benefits as they're earned. So under the PEPPER rules, employers can't agree to pay any portion of employees' required contributions. So under a new DB plan, because of PEPRA, represented employees would have to contribute at least 50% of the normal costs of those benefits. Next slide, please. A related question that we looked at is whether the assets of a new DB plan could be commingled or combined with the assets of the existing DB plan. Um, the answer to that is yes, um, and that would result in economies of scale uh, with respect to plan investment fees and expenses, um, including costs for an investment consultant and other plan service providers. Um, and this would also streamline the plan administration because there's a, you know, a current retirement board for the existing DB plan, and that board could also act as the fiduciary and plan administrator for the new plan and oversee the investments for the new plan sort of as part of its current role with the existing DB plan. Next slide, please. Um, and the next question I reviewed was whether current represented employees could use their account balances in the 401A DC plan to make required contributions to a new DB plan on a prospective basis. We just talked about as required under PEPRA, a change to a DB plan would involve represented employees moving from not making any required employee contributions to having to fund 50% um, of the normal cost of the DB plan benefits. Uh, usually that is done through salary reduction. Um, because using uh, current 401A account balances to fund benefits under a new DB plan would involve a transfer of assets between tax qualified retirement plans, we wouldn't recommend implementing this option unless a private letter ruling from the IRS were obtained to sort of ensure that this transaction would comply with applicable tax rules and, and wouldn't result in any negative tax consequences for employees. But if the IRS did approve the option of using existing DC plan account balances sort of as an initial funding mechanism uh, for a DB plan, that would help reduce the immediate financial impact on represented employees of having to make those employee contributions to a DB plan. Um, just a little more information about a private letter ruling. Um, the process for getting one of those from the IRS involves having legal counsel prepare a submission package that describes the transaction and then requests specific rulings about tax compliance for the transaction. Um, the IRS charges a user fee of $38,000 to process a PLR request. And that process typically takes, I would say, between like nine and 18 months, um, with nine months being a best case scenario. Next slide, please. Another question I reviewed is whether represented employees could be offered a choice on an individual basis between the current 401A DC plan and a DB plan. And under the applicable tax rules, I don't believe there would be any risk in allowing newly hired represented employees to make a one-time revocable election between the current 401A plan and a DB plan. Uh, that election would have to be made upon hire um, and it couldn't be changed in the future. They're pretty much locked into that for as long as their employment continues. But for current represented employees, I think it's unlikely that the IRS would agree that providing an election on an individual basis between the two plans would comply with applicable tax rules. Uh, and because of the potential for significant negative tax consequences for current employees, I wouldn't recommend implementing an election for current employees unless the IRS approved it in advance through a private letter ruling. Um, one advantage of the PLR process is that you know you file the submission and the IRS starts reviewing it, and then they typically will tell you informally before they put anything in writing how they're planning to rule. Um, so if the ruling is not going to be favorable, the request can either be revised um, to, to get a favorable ruling or just withdrawn. Uh, next slide, please. Um, instead of establishing a brand new DB plan, I also reviewed the option of reopening the existing DB plan for represented employees on a prospective basis. This is a potential option, although similar to establishing a brand new DB plan, it would require compliance with the PEPA rules for 
things like the benefit formula, the mandatory employee contributions of at least 50% of the normal cost of benefits, um, limits on the annual dollar amount and pay types that can be treated as pensionable compensation. Um, so the same issues that I covered for a new DB plan would apply to this option. Um, and there would also be other compliance issues that would need to be considered if, as part of this option, the 401A DC plan were to be terminated. Next slide. Um, and the last issue is if the DB plan were reopened, whether it could be reopened on a retroactive basis, meaning that current represented employees could receive service credit under the plan for prior years of employment. And I don't want to say it's impossible, but I think it's unlikely, um, and it would involve a lot of actuarial analysis to see whether it could be done in a way that complies with PEPRA, um, and I'll talk more about that on the next slide. And this also would require obtaining a private letter ruling from the IRS if current 401A plan account balances were used to fund the cost of prior service credit. So one of the PEPRA rules is a prohibition on retroactive benefit enhancements. Um, so the only way that providing prior service credit could comply with PEPRA would be if the plan's actuary determined that providing that service credit with employees funding 50% of the normal cost of those benefits would not be an impermissible benefit enhancement. And the term enhancement is not defined in PEPRA, so this would really involve using just a good faith, reasonable interpretation of the law. Um, and the determination would need to be made on an individual employee by employee basis because each employee's 401A account balance is different and the benefits that they would receive for prior years of employment under the DB plan would also be different. Um, we assumed that this would also involve using employees' current 401A account balances as a way to fund the cost of benefits provided for prior years of employment. Um, and our recommendation would be not to try to implement that without first obtaining a private letter ruling from the IRS. You really would want to make sure that that would comply with applicable tax rules and would not result in any negative tax consequences for employees. So the last slide um, is sort of a summary of the options that I covered. Um, and this notes that some of them are more complex than others. Um, some of them are less likely to be able to comply with PEPRA um, or to be approved by the IRS as compliant with applicable tax rules for tax qualified retirement plans. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have or turn it back over to Larry. Did you have anything to add? No, I can just, um, it, it, as Liz had mentioned, you know, this is an extremely complex issue. Um, and I think, you know, looking at, at some of the areas in terms of, of what is, is possible, I mean, a, a defined benefit plan is possible for, for new hires uh, moving forward. Um, you know, from a, from a current member perspective, um, as, as Liz had mentioned, it's unlikely, but it would require that PLR from the IRS. Um, and so, you know, that's really kind of how it's all coming together at this point. So that we can, we can move over to the actuarial analysis. If no, I think we're going to discuss this first. Okay. Um, but, uh, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Mason. Oh, wait, I, I believe we are going to hear the two of them at once, right? And I, I apologize, Larry. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and hear the two items, um, at once. Hey, good morning. Um, I'm Ann Harper, and I'm here with Alice Allsberg, and we are going to go through the actuarial perspective of the difference between a DB and a DC plan. Um, we're going to compare and contrast those two benefit structures, and then uh, we're going to determine what that means in terms of benefits and levels of contributions, and then also risk, which is a key factor here. So just to give a little bit of background, even though it was previously mentioned in uh, with the legal counsel's presentation, um, the, the new employees of San Diego Transit Corporation, the ATU and the IBW are in a defined uh, contribution plan, a DC plan, if you will. And those are members who were hired after November 1st, 2012 for the ATU and for IBW, it's all members hired on or after May 1st, 2011. 
Um, currently, there are about 457 members in the DC plan, and they have an average age of about 44 years old. And that is important in terms of um, not a DC plan necessarily, but in terms of what we use to calculate the cost of the DB benefit. And we, with, with all of our cost analysis, we, we use the current DC cohort to, to do our cost analysis on even though we know they may not be eligible or there's a lot of outstanding questions there still, but that's what we use for our cost analysis. So um, currently SDTC, the corporation contributes 6% of pay with up to that 2% match if the employee also makes that 2%. So um, uh, a benefit, again, what we use in our calculations is that the member will make that 2% and the uh, employer will make 8%. Um, and currently the IBW and the ATU members um, that are in the DB plan, they are making 8% contributions, 8% of pay, um, each and every pay period, and those are mandatory contributions. Okay. So with the DB has the mandatory contributions, um, now here we're looking at the defined contribution plan and the employee contribution levels, um, which again are optional. Um, and just to note here that um, the current average DC plan member salary is about $56,000. So you can see here that about 132 or about 30% of the members are not making any contributions on the employee base, on the employee level. Um, about 30% are making 2% or less. So um, that means that eight, more than 60% are contributing 2% or less um, in this DC plan. Um, and then a special note, uh, the employee contribution rate at 5% and above, only 17 are paying um, that level of contribution. And that is relevant because when you we get to our cost analysis, um, the DB cost for the employees, that 50% of normal cost is somewhere between um, 5% and 10%, depending on the plan and the, the demographics and such. So that's why that's relevant, that only 17% are currently contributing at that level that they would be required to under a DB plan. So here uh, we're doing this comparison of a DB versus a DC plan. And this is pretty high level and we'll go into details more when we get to the end of the presentation. Um, but in general, a DB benefit is known in advanced and it's guaranteed versus a defined contribution, it's unknown in advance and it is not guaranteed. Um, the, for a DB plan, you get a fixed monthly benefit for life. Um, and then on a DC side, you get a lump sum benefit, um, like a pot of money when you retire. And that's based on contribution levels and investment performance. The risk bearers is uh, very different between the two structures in the DB plan. The uh, the employer does most of the uh, risk taking or is 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 needs to um, basically just has more of the risk involved when it comes to investments. And then for the um, uh, for the DC plan, the employee is more of the risk bearer when it comes to the structure of the plan. Um, you know, they need to know will they have enough money to retire and how long will that pot of money actually last them um, in a DC plan. In terms of investment management fees, on the DB side, they're generally higher because you hire professional investment consultants to come in every year um, and monitor like which asset classes are being um, chosen to invest in. Uh, and they're generally lower for the DC side. Um, they're hired initially, um, but then after that, they're not needed on an annual basis. And it's really the employee who makes those decisions. And the last item here is portability, which um, it really can be seen as one of the uh, bigger issues for members. Um, for a DC plan, um, there's 100% portability and there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to a DC plan. The account balance is fully transferable should, should the employee leave. Um, and even when they retire, uh, it's fully transferable to them to take and invest as they wish. 
Uh, with the DB plan, that's not true. Once a member becomes vested in the DB plan, they have no access to their uh, benefit, not even their employee contributions until they actually retire and they take their benefit in the form of a life annuity. Um, so, and then on the DB side also, um, the, the lack of portability also comes into play if a member does not complete their full career with MTS, let's say they want to move to Sacramento after 15 years of service here, and then they move to Sacramento and get another similar job um, with the Sac Sacramento Transit Authority. Um, so they have two different benefits. One here, their benefit would be calculated based on their salary when they left mid-career here at MTS, whereas then they move to Sacramento and then they're you know, continuing to get salary increases and in their benefit in Sacramento is based on a much higher salary towards uh, when they retire. So it kind of breaks up that, that benefit for members who don't stay here for the full career. And then lastly, um, if a member is single on the DB side, once they retire and if they, uh, th they die very early after retirement, the benefit just stops. There's no um, um, ability to transfer any accounts. It just it, the annuity is is, is ceased. Um, whereas, of course, in a DC plan, it is a pot of money that can be willed or given to a beneficiary or an estate. So, and Liz went over this a little bit in her. Um, presentation, but uh, with the new uh, PEPRA legislation, members must contribute at least 50% of that normal cost, that cost of what the benefits actually are. Um, and then the employer level of, of contribution is also that 50%, but they are also responsible for uh, adjusting their contribution levels uh, to fund the plan when actual ex assumptions are not met. And then again, the current DC plan, um, Employee contributions are optional, 6% of pay for the, from the employer, and then a 2% match. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about the risks of these two different plans, because um, they are. this is where they really differ in their structure. Uh, there's mortality risk, which is one of the bigger risks in a DC plan, and that is members can outlive their pot of money that they receive. Uh, from the pension. Whereas in a DB plan, that risk is pooled amongst all the members in the plan. Um, that monthly benefit is guaranteed for life, whether you live two years after retirement or 40 years after retirement. You are guaranteed that monthly benefit stream until you, until you die. Um, so in a DB plan, you're really funding for um, an average expected life life expectancy of your group, where on a DC side you don't really want to you don't really want to fund your benefit or expect your benefit only to live until your life expectancy, which in this plan is about eighty one or eighty two years old. Um, and then there's the investment risk for um, for the DB side. The benefit does not change if the plan earns zero percent every year or if it earns 15% every year from when the member was hired to when they retire and even to when they died. Nothing changes. The benefit is that fixed formula for life. So it's very certain. It's very uh, a guaranteed benefit. Whereas on the DC side, of course, there is investment risk that comes with that because your account balance, it grows with your contribution levels, right? but a, a large portion of your benefit does come from those investment earnings from when you start, uh, you become a member in the plan through your retirement. And then even after retirement, you have that investment risk uh, always with the DC plan. And lastly, we have the investment management risks. Um, for the DB plan, it's the MTS board who makes all the investment decisions and the, these are pooled funds, they're managed professionally. And then on the uh, DC side, the participant is responsible uh, for the investment decisions. And not only prior to retirement, but after retirement, um, they have the questions that they need to think about of how do I invest my funds? Do I Am I gonna be risk-free and just in, invest everything in treasuries and fixed income so that I have a secure benefit, but I'm knowing that you're gonna have a much lower benefit? Or do I uh, also, uh, 
put my money and allocate some of my funds to equities and what's the right mix there and how does that change over my career um so there's just a lot more decisions that need to be made and especially once a member does retire they need to uh, think very uh, strongly about how they're going to and how much money they're going to withdraw from their uh, retirement each and every year. So it may require an additional financial planner at some point in time for uh, the DC members um, so that they are, have some professional advice that they can um, can rely on. And I know a lot of DC um plans have that professional advice, you know, for them and available to them once, you know, they're, uh, when they are a member of the system, I don't know exactly what the structure is after retirement, but that is just as important as well. Next, I'll go ahead and step us through the actuarial cost analysis that we performed looking at two of the defined benefit options for potential new plans. Um, as Liz stated, as Ann stated, uh, right now, <clears throat> any new plan would be held to the PEPRA requirements. So those requirements under the Public Employees Pension Reform Act, effective January 2023. And high level that uh, the PEPRA requirements have limited benefit formulas, which we'll take a look at, two different variations. Uh, there are final compensation restrictions in that the benefit formula would use a 36 month consecutive average for the benefit calculation. And the pensionable compensation has certain exclusions, uh, overtime pay, unused sick, uh, unused vacation cannot go into the compensation that's used to calculate the retirement benefit. The big ticket item under PEPRA is this idea of equal sharing of the normal cost contributions between the employee and the employer. So to restate, because the normal cost, the concept of the normal cost and that normal cost payment is very important. So to restate the definition of normal cost or just a understanding of normal cost, it's the amount of money or the cost that's allocated for the member's benefit in a given year. So if an employee works for 20 years and they earn a certain benefit at the end of their, that would start at the end of their retirement, excuse me, at the beginning of the retirement for the rest of their life, the normal cost is the value that's allocated to every year while they were working, the cost of paying for that benefit that would begin at retirement. So the normal cost depends on the benefit formula. And very importantly, it depends on this concept of entry age or the average entry age of the employees who are entering the system. Currently, the DC plan has 457 members, currently meaning as of the, the date of the data cut, the census data that we received for this actuarial analysis. And those 457 members have an average age of 44. So if you were to retire at age 65, that means they have just shy of 20 years to fund their benefit with annual normal cost payments. So the assumptions that we used in our actuarial analysis were that no past service would be granted. This would be effective from the date of the effect, the effective date of this potential new plan until retirement. So not looking at past service. Uh, members may have a choice between the DC and the DB plan. And for that reason, we did a variation of calculations looking at different entry ages because the sensitivity to entry age uh, is relevant in the cost of the plan to the members. Overall, any deviations to plan experience. So when we're, when we're calculating any actuarial calculations have a whole set of assumptions, underlying assumptions. Uh, the turnover of the participants, mortality of the participants, uh, investment returns, et cetera. So when we perform actuarial calculations, we assume that all assumptions will be met. And these assumptions that were used are outlined in our most recent actuarial valuation report, which was the July 1st, 2022 valuation report. And any deviations in assumptions under a defined benefit plan, as Anne mentioned, that risk 
goes to the employer. So any deviations in cost, aside from the assumptions, would, would be part of an unfunded actuarial liability payment that the employer would be making should there be deviations in the assumptions, which, as we know, on a year-to-year -year basis, sometimes there are gains, sometimes there are losses, inexperience on the defined benefit plans. All right, let's take a look at the results of this actuarial analysis. So again, we're looking at the 457 defined contribution members. Those members have an entry age of 44. With that, there are two potential options. And we looked at these two options directed by uh, Larry and his team because it, well, actually by you guys, uh, they span the, the spectrum of potential cal uh, benefit formulas the 2% at 62 being at the high end, and then the 1.5% at 65 at the low end. So that's 2% of pay, of final average compensation, times years of service. So the total normal cost, so that's percent of pay on an annual basis to pay for these benefits, the total normal cost under the 2% at 62 is 17.34%. And under PEPRA with the 50-50 cost sharing, so the member and the employer would share approximately 50-50 in that cost, is 8.67%. So the member would be paying 8.67% and the employer would be paying 8.67%. And we do add the line item there towards the bottom, that initial UAL payment rate, because initially when you launch into a pension plan, a DB plan, there is no unfunded actuarial liability. So initially that's zero. Uh, and that has the possibility to fluctuate up or down depending on the experience of the plan. But under PEPRA, regardless of any funded or unfunded or surplus, the employee and the employer would pay 50% of the normal cost. So at the 1.5% at 65, that total normal cost is quite notably less at 10.94% for the total normal cost rate and 5.47% would be the employer's rate and the employee's contribution rate. So I'm gonna pause on that and take into perspective the DC uh, contributions that the members are making that Ann covered Currently, 60% of the DC members are making 2% or less of contributions, and it was a uh, smaller percentage, 15%, 17%, that were at that 8% or higher in, uh, on the contributions from the member. Now, I would like to restress the importance of the demographics of the active membership in the plan when it comes to this normal cost. So under PEPRA, that normal cost rate is typically calculated as an aggregate normal cost rate for the plan. So the entry age of the employees does play into the calculation. And because of the significance of that entry age, we also ran the analysis only looking at the oldest 25th percentile of those members. And if only the oldest, hypothetically, were to enter the DB plan, then that uh, contribution rate on the 2% at 62, rather than 8.67%, it would increase to 11.2%. So about two and a half percent increase on an older population's entry age. And for the youngest 25 percentile, that 8.67% with that average entry age of 44, if we looked at the younger 25%, it would be 6%. And so that provides perspective in that potential fluctuation in that normal cost rate based on the entry age of the aggregate population in the defined benefit plan. Okay. So rates, when you look at normal cost rates, that provides one perspective from an actual analysis. And then uh, another tangible perspective is looking at the actual dollars from individual examples. So I'll step us through three examples that we looked at in our actual analysis. And all three examples use this basis. So we're looking at a 40-year-old member. So we're saying you enter at age 44 into this defined benefit plan. Average salary, excuse me, current salary, 56,000. And this member hypothetically works 25 years and retires at age 65. 
the underlying assumptions for the calculations that annual salary increases are 3%, which is the assumed rate uh, on the current member's pension plan, investment returns of 6%, and the life expectancies from the mortality of the 2022 evaluation for the open plan. First, we'll take a look at a, the defined contribution plan. So if the employee were to contribute 2% of pay and the employer made that 6% contribution with the 2% match, so that's a total of 10% of pay going into the defined contribution plan. The employee contributions over that 25 year period would be 400, uh, excuse me, 40,800. The employer contributions, 163,000. And the investment returns, quite powerful, at 206,000. So that's about 50% of the account balance comes from the investment performance at 6%. So at a tw after 25 years of service, a member would uh, hypothetically have an account balance of 410,000. Now on the defined benefit plan, assuming the 2% at 62 formula, the employee and the employer, as we covered in the prior table that I showed, would be contributing 8.67% of pay each. So that 8.67% of pay over the course of, of the uh, employment, 25 years, the initial 56,000 with 3% increase would produce a 177,000, excuse me, I was jumping down to the final average salary. Um, so the two uh, employer contributions, 8.67, 8.67, amounts to the dollars put in of 177,000 each. The average salary for that member at the end of their career would reach 110,000 with the 3% increases for 25 years of service would provide for an annual benefit for the remainder of the life of the employee of 55,000. And similarly on the lower benefit formula, so this is the one and a half percent at 65, going through the same uh, process of calculations the normal cost rate here was lower at the 5.4%. This, under this formula, the member would receive at 65, 41,000 for their lifetime as their defined benefit. Okay, so my job now is kind of to make sense of all of this uh, for you, um, and I'll try to do my best here uh, with Focusing on the defined contribution plan, the very left-hand side of this table, and I'm going to be comparing that to the 1.5% at 65 uh, benefit formula. And the reason I am doing that, it's a more of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison in terms of the contribution levels going into the plan, both plans. Um, so how do we compare these benefits? Well, talking about the DC benefit, uh, based on that 6% uh, return each and every year um, and the contribution levels that we have discussed, the pot of money at retirement would be around $410,000 for the DC person. Um, well, how do we compare that to the DB benefit? Well, we make assumptions like we do with everything else with the defined benefit plan. And assuming that this person lives into the expected life expectancy, which is right around 81 and a half years old. So assuming they live 16 and a half years and the fund will continue to earn, not the fund, but their account balance will continue to earn 6% each and every year after retirement, they would be able to draw down about $38,000 a year and it would last that 16 and a half years. And then at the end of that 16 and a half years, there would be no uh, benefit left for that person. So that's really what that means, the equivalent annual benefit. Uh, and as we know, that is still just one pot of money. And that's, that's a hypothetical scenario, but it's the best way to kind of compare. Now, the risk there, as we've talked about, is what if after retirement, the fund only earns 5% each and every year, right? 
So they get to age 78, 79, and there's no money left because their investments have not performed as they expected, correct? And then on the flip side, what if the investments earn 6% each and every year, but the member lives until they're 85? So there's that mortality and investment risk that comes with that DC benefit. But risks are not always negative, right? There's always a positive side to risks as well. Otherwise, we would never take them, right? So on the flip side, what if the, you know, the pension fund earned, or not the pension fund, the DB account, the DC account balance earned like 8% each and every year? Well, that member would get that return. And that would, that's because the risk falls on the, the member and the employee. So on the flip side, if investments do better, then the employee does better as well. Um, and I don't know if this is this is not a good way to put like a positive risk of someone dying earlier than expected, but in the actuarial world, it, it is, unfortunately. But if someone does, um, you know, die very shortly after they um, retire, like let's say they die at 78, well, they've, they've gotten their full uh, their their benefit, or they they you know have not out, they have not outlived their benefit, and they're able to you know have a great retirement and and still have all of that money and money to potentially pass on to uh, their uh, beneficiaries or estate. So then, equivalently, looking at the DB benefit, the one and a half percent at sixty five. Uh, their benefit is not a pot of money. It's that life annuity, right? It's that forty-one and a half thousand dollars every year until they pass. Well, to make that equivalent to what that pot of money would be is, um, what if they lived until they were eighty-one and a half, and the um, that and they earned six percent on uh, a pot of money? What? would that pot of money, that present value of that benefit be? And that present value of that benefit is $450,000. So it's very similar to the 410 in the DC plan, right? And that's because the contribution levels here are very similar. It's 10% in the DC plan, and it's about 11% in the DB plan. Um, but one of the striking things that's different about the contribution levels under these two scenarios is that under the DC scenario, the member pays about 20% of the contribution effort, whereas in the DB plan, the member pays 50% of that contribution uh, effort. So um, in, the, in this scenario, the member would pay about $40,000 in the DC plan over their, their life or their career, and the member in the if they were in the DB plan would pay almost three times as much as about one hundred and eleven thousand um, dollars. So those are kind of the risks, the mortality risk, the investment risk, what your benefits you're getting, how you're getting them, how they're being paid, and all of the decisions that have to be made within uh, each of these plans. And then the one thing I just wanted to leave you with as well that we haven't really talked about is. And the DC plan, we talk about this $410,000. Well, again, the, the member bears that investment risk, positive or negative. And so we did a, two examples. If it only earned 3% each year, that $410,000 would be about $285,000 only. However, what if the member earned 9% each and every year that they were working on their DC plan, that pot of money would be closer to $610,000. Um, and then to reiterate, and I know Alice had already said this, but I just wanted to make it clear that that employer contribution line for the DB plan is if every actuarial assumption is met each and every year, the contribution level for the employer does change. If there are gains and losses and assumptions are not met, they are the ones that are basically on the hook for making sure there's enough money in the pension fund to pay for all benefits for all employees. So with that, I know it's a lot. Um, we're able to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Uh, before we go, I believe Sharon has a few comments. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the analysis, and thank you very much for 
all of the hard work on this. Um, the analysis shows that probably for MTS, it's not a significant uh, burden or you know financial burden in, if we were to move in this direction. Um, the real question is, is the benefits for the employee? And then the other thing is the assumptions that you're going to make. Is everybody gonna have to be in the plan? Um, are they, will they be required to be in the plan or is it an opt-in type of scenario? So those are a lot of big questions that ha would have to be you know, decided as a policy, but ultimately it has to be negotiated through the bargaining um, units if we were gonna move in any direction. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentations, uh, Ms. Mason and uh, Ms. Harper. Uh, Clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to comment on item number four? We have no public comments. Wonderful, okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna move on to comments from members of the committee. Would any members of the committee like to comment? I see Council President Shanila Rivera on the lights. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for, for bringing this conversation forward. Um, this is super interesting. I really appreciate the analysis here. The one piece that I'm still kind of curious about, and, and maybe it's just too speculative to be able to put numbers to it, it would be the potential benefits that come from retention um, of employees. Um, I think part of the assumption here is that folks who are enrolled in a pension program are more likely to stay. And there's certainly cost benefits to um, at least at every place that I've ever worked and um, been involved in from a management perspective, there's considerable cost benefits that can come from folks um, staying with an organization. Um, there's considerable costs that come from recruitment and having to train new folks. And so uh, I, I am curious to what extent we can account for projected retention benefits, savings and training, things of that nature that might come with having a pension program. I think it might be out of Chiron's um, area of expertise, but um, if I know um, our HR people have been looking at that. And if you look at our experience since the um, benefit was negotiated away, I don't believe our retention levels have declined over time. Um, our, our challenge is the hiring aspect of it. Um, and Jeff, do you, have you guys done an analysis? I know, um, a couple of years ago, you showed me something to that effect. So I know this, I mean, the city definitely had, there was retention impacts for sure. Mm. Um, we were simply less competitive than you know, municipal, municipal agencies that offered pensions, so. Yeah, we haven't done a formal analysis, but clearly, you know, some people would absolutely love a pension and that would keep them to stay. And to say it's entirely a benefit um, there is a cost to it as well. You employees stay for longer, and they the employees that are longer uh, generally cost more than replacing with newer employees. But I think it would provide a benefit to employees to um, have a defi defined benefit pension plan. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, for sure. Folks who have been here longer cost more. There's benefits that come from that. Um, and when we're in a situation we have a we have trouble recruiting, um, it's one thing to have turnover when you don't have a problem filling positions. It's another thing to have turnover when you're just seeing folks exit and not seeing the same rate of folks entering. So, um, I, I guess maybe one more point is when we study people that leave, they're never saying, "I'm leaving because I'm taking a job with a pension elsewhere." Mm -hmm. It's that they're unhappy with, say, for example, being a bus operator and the yeah. conditions of being a bus operator. Um, and so when we're losing candidates who we're trying to recruit for bus operator, they're going to work for companies like Amazon and other private sector companies that don't have a defined benefit pension. So it's, it's complicated. I don't know um, how you actually quantify in dollars how, what that benefit would provide in terms of recruitment retention. Got it. But I think we could do an analysis for you um, of retention since we um, bargained away the pension for these bargaining units and, and over time has retention slipped. And would it be possible to look at agencies who have pensions and see if they seem to have better retention rates than, or worse, perhaps, you know, yeah, whatever the case is. 
Yeah, we could look at, for instance, our peer bus operators. I mean, because you'd yeah. want it to be yep. specific yep. to the same type of work. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking at the one and a half percent at 65 column versus the defined contribution, and they look fairly similar in terms of account balances. I think the defined benefit, if I was a prospective employee, would be more attractive because it's certain. Uh, the defined contribution, uh, I don't know that people are really <clears throat> risky with their retirement investments that they would earn 9%. So that, I probably wouldn't go there to say, wow, they could really beat the defined benefit because most people are risk averse the closer you get to retirement. Could it actually go less than 3%? Oh my gosh, look at the past two or three years. People lost a lot of their 401k for whatever, 403b, if that's applicable. Uh, <clears throat> so there are negative returns. But if you knew that you're going to get that that $41,000 paycheck for the rest of your life, regardless of how the market uh, performs, that's a great, attractive tool for all levels in the organization. So that's kind of how I look at these two. Uh, similar cost, uh, but certainly a greater benefit for attraction purposes under the defined benefit. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other members on the light, so um, I do have comments of my own. Um, it seems like every single business in our economy right now is dealing with difficulty in recruiting and retaining staff. Uh, public transit agencies like MTS, I think, are certainly no different. Um, the fact is, is our, our economy is facing persistent labor shortages. That will require all of us to rethink our assumptions about what is appropriate compensation and what is uh, appropriate retirement security. Um, this is already happening in the private sector. Uh, just last week, the New York Times reported that IBM, which was one of the first companies to offer a 401k in 1983, has just announced that it's re restarting a, defi a defined uh, benefits pension plan next year. Um, in this context, I think it makes sense for MTS to explore offering a defined uh, benefit pension to the employees of the San Diego Transit Corporation. Um, that's why I've been calling for this analysis uh, to be done, I think now for, I wanna say like three or four years. Uh, so I do appreciate that staff brought in the experts to do so and presented this, their results to this committee. I thoroughly um, do appreciate this because this is the start of a very important conversation. Um, and I think the good news is um, the presentation indicates that while it, indeed it is very complicated, um, it is absolutely possible for us to offer defined pension, uh, defined pension pensions again to all of our San Diego transit employees. Um, I think there were a lot of questions asked today um, and all of those questions proposed uh, are found at the negotiating table. Uh, so I think the next steps will be for management to bring our employee bargaining groups representatives um, represented by, I'm sorry, IBEW and ATU to the table to discuss uh, possible steps moving forward. Um, and I do want to be clear uh, that whatever specific proposal comes before the board will have to be negotiated with our employees. And I want to see real input from our employee groups in the design of any new pension system. Um, to be honest, I'm kind of shocked that we didn't get any anybody from the unions um, in the two representative unions uh, call us today. I, I'm just floored uh, that nobody called in. Um, but I want to say, you know, as long as I'm in public office, I'm going to continue to be an advocate for defined benefit pensions. And um, I'm going to be very proud when all of our transit workers can receive a, a real retirement security. Um, you know, when I see the 6%, um, I have the same thoughts as uh, my colleague does. Um, the last, I think, 23 years, right? We've seen some three very, very extremely bad years um, that would shake anybody's retirement boots, right? Um, this is uh, a topic that is um, very near and dear to my heart um, because uh, my family didn't have the 
um, educational background to think about 401ks to contribute to, you know, nobody taught them. Um, and the fact I am, I'm not the first one in my family to have a pension. My grandpa was a fisherman and he had a pension. Um, but I think that given the amount of money that we pay our workers and given the fact that it's really hard to um, get new bus employee, new bus drivers, I think this is something that we really need to look into. And um, I welcome uh, the, the two uh, representative groups to come and, and be at the bargaining table. And, and I wanna hear from them, to be honest. Um, so this concludes my comments on this item. Um, I thank you again, Sharon, once again, you have, we have asked and you have delivered. Um, and I do really appreciate um, our request being taken into consideration. Um, and thank you to the, all the presenters for your thoughtful presentation. Um, and this was an informational item. So um, we are gonna move on to item number five, which is another informational report. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, this is the fiscal thank year you. 20, no problem. Uh, this is the fiscal year 2024 operating budget forecast. Um, and I believe uh, Gordon Meyer is gonna be given the presentation. So the floor is yours. And while Gordon steps up to uh, to the table there, um, we just wanted to bring in front of the Budget Development Committee an updated forecast for our current fiscal year. We're going to be in the process of, uh, of the budget doing a mid-year adjustment, um, as well as um, bringing the capital budget as well as fiscal year 2025 shortly to the Budget Development Committee. Uh, but we wanted to continue to provide updates to uh, the Budget Development Committee with the latest and greatest information that we have. So with that, I'll pass it over to Gordon. Good morning, my name is Gordon Meyer. I'm the Manager of Financial Planning and Analysis here at uh, MTS. Uh, like Mary, Larry just mentioned, um, I wanted to provide an overview of the FY24 operating budget uh, specifically a reforecast given the expense and revenue uh, assumption changes that we're seeing. So just a high level overview of the budget development process. So the original FY24 budget was passed in May of 2023. Uh, since then, we've been coming back to the board with uh, monthly updates on the year to date variances, as well as identification of major trends. Uh, so that's mostly a backward look, and so the purpose of this presentation is really to give a forward look for the rest of the year. Um, and so the next budget development cycle starts in January, so about a month away. Um, and so we'll be meeting with all the managers to review their expense and revenue trends. Uh, we'll roll all those up uh, and then publish our original or our amended budget after taking it to the board in March of 2024. Uh, we'll begin developing the FY25 operating budget at the same time uh, in January. However, that one we build from the ground up uh, with a zero-based budgeting process, so that'll take some additional work. Uh, we'll meet with the BDC multiple times and then plan on bringing that to the board in May of 2024. So some of the major themes that we're seeing so far this year. Um, so one is ridership recovery. Uh, this has been a consistent focus of ours. Uh, we do continue to see ridership grow, but it has been growing slower than what we had assumed in the budget. And so we are revising our passenger level and passenger revenue forecast downward in this forecast, uh, as we'll get into more detail on later. Another focus is the implementation of the SB 125 funds. Uh, so specifically in FY24, we need to include budget for the security enhancements that were approved by the board, as well as uh, we're including funding for IRIS rapid operations. And then just in general, it's a major focus this year, getting that application in and really uh, building that funding into our overall strategy. Uh, next, we have bus service restorations. So last year in FY23, we had reduced service due to driver shortages. And although the driver shortage has improved, it hasn't improved materially, materially enough, uh, especially with our contractors, um, to where we want to plan on bringing all that service back. So we are reducing our service level forecast in this um, projection as well. Uh, and then lastly, we continue to have a large structural deficit that we uh, cover with federal stimulus funds. In the original FY24 budget, we had included a $51.1 million uh, structural deficit. 
And then, so this presentation is really looking at the major expense and revenue assumption changes so far. And that's based on uh, data from July through September or basically quarter one of our FY24. So getting into the numbers. So first we'll take a look at our operating revenues. Um, and a big driver of that is our passenger levels or our ridership. Uh, so in our the original FY24 budget, we had budgeted 80.7 million passengers. Uh, that equates to about an 18% year-over-year increase over the final FY23 ridership. Uh, now, ridership in FY23 was artificially low in May and June because we had the strike. Um, so at the time of last year's budget, we were actually budgeting about an 11 or 12% increase year-over-year -year, um, over the budgeted figure from last year. Um, however, if you look at the chart to the right, uh, you can see the blue line, that's last year's ridership, and then you can see the orange line, that is uh, what we budgeted for this year. And then if you look at the purple line in between those two, um, you can see the solid part of that purple line is the actual ridership in July and Sept through September, and you can see we're uh, below what we had budgeted. And so uh, for the rest of the year, we are bringing the forecast down. Um, we're now projecting 77.3 million passengers, and that was a result of reworking our whole passenger forecast where we build it from the ground up uh, by operator and then consolidate it. Um, and that right now equates to about a 3.4 million reduction in passengers or 4.3% uh, reduction versus the original budget. And instead of an 18% year-over-year growth, we're now projecting about 13%. So the other piece uh, related to our ridership is the, how that translates into revenue. Uh, so we had originally budgeted 78.9 million. Uh, that was about a 17% year-over-year increase. Um, so far from July through September, we were unfavorable to budget by 774,000 or 4.1%. And we've seen about a 9.3% uh, year over year growth so far versus the 17% overall that's included in the budget. And so once again, to the on the chart to the right, you can see the purple line is well below the orange line, especially in July and August. Uh, September was closer, but it was more of a function of an accrual entry related to how we spread the UPASS revenue. Um, so we actually missed our ridership target um, about similarly to July and August. Um, so we are revising the passenger revenue forecast down to 75.9 million, uh, which is a reduction of about 3.1 million from the original budget or 3.9%. So the other piece of our operating revenue uh, is the ca big category called other revenue. And that includes things like energy credits, advertising, interest income. So I wanted to give a brief overview of some of those major categories. Uh, so energy credits, so we generate revenue uh, through two programs. There's the LCFS program on the state side, and then we have the RINs program on the federal side. And we generate credits based on our consumption of RNG, renewable natural gas, which is our CNG, uh, electricity because it's zero emission, and, and then as well as propane because it's cleaner than diesel. Um, and so these credits are sold in the marketplace, either directly by us or by some of our energy vendors. And on average, we generate about $8 million a year in revenue um, from these programs combined. So it's a fairly uh, lucrative part of our budget. And so I wanted to just give an update on how those credit prices are behaving so far this year. Uh, so first, we'll look at the LCFS credit price. So if you look at the chart on the top right, you can see the red line is what we budgeted for FY24. And you can see we had it starting at $85 in the beginning of the year and then gradually growing to $100 by the end of the year. Uh, and that was based on... Uh, projections from ARB that we had from last year. Uh, they changed their carbon intensity targets uh, overall this year, and that was expected to increase the demand for uh, credits in the marketplace and drive up the price, but we haven't seen that yet. And so you can see the yellow line is our actual experience so far through from July through September. 
And we started the year at 75 uh, versus 85 budget. And then right now uh, you can see September and October, we're right around $70. And so for this forecast, we're bringing the price down to $70 for the rest of the year, because we just don't, we're not gonna increase that target until we see evidence that it's actually gonna start going up. Um, fortunately, from a revenue perspective, that's been completely offset this year by how well the RINs credits are performing. And so you can see in the bottom chart on the right, uh, the red line is what we had budgeted for the entire year. So we budgeted $2 for the entire year. And if you look at the blue line, that was actually last year. And January through April is when we're doing budget development and it was right around $2. So that's why we stuck with $2. Um, but if you jump to the yellow line on top, that is uh, our experience so far. And we started the year at $3. So 30% higher than what we had budgeted. And then it's gone up to uh, 330. And then right now it's hovering around 310. And so for this forecast, uh, we're assuming 310 the rest of the way. Um, and so those two things are almost exactly counteracting each other at this point. So we're not adjusting the budget in this forecast, um, but we did want to give an update on those prices. Uh, next, we have interest revenue. So this is good news. Um, we budgeted 1.9 million, which you can see is the red bar to the right. Um, and interest revenue is really a function of your cash balances and the interest rates. And so prior to FY23, we were average, we had an average monthly cash balance of about 60 to 70 million. Last year in FY23, it was 144 million. And then this year we're projecting 180 million in our average cash balance, really a result of the stimulus draws that we've been doing as well as our FTA formula share went up. Uh, a couple of years ago. And so that combined with interest rates being at their 22 year highs, it's currently the targets five and a half percent at the Fed. Um, that's resulting in a huge interest number for us this year. And so we're now forecasting 7.9 million for FY24, which is about a $6 million increase versus the original budget. Um, so that's the operating revenue. So now I want to just briefly cover some of our major subsidy revenue categories. Um, and first we'll look at sales tax revenues. So this is a large part of our budget. Um, that includes Transnet and TDA. Um, so Transnet, we receive a formula share. Um, for FY24, the original budget, we had used Sandag's regional target of $430 million. And at the time, that represented a 1% year-over-year growth over the FY23 budget. And then when you run that through their uh, formulas for sharing regionally, our share of that in the original budget was $46.8 million. And so we track the cash receipts uh, on a monthly basis to see where we think we're going to end up for the year. So cash receipts so far are actually down year-over-year year by 1.6%. However, that trend is skewed uh, because the filing deadlines with the state were postponed to November. And so we're expecting a huge flood of delayed payments um, in November. And um, just for context, um, Avenue is a third party consultant that Sandag contracts with to provide uh, sales tax forecasts. They're projecting 433 million, which is above the original budget and would result in about a 300K increase for MTS. Uh, we do our own forecast, which is a little less conservative, but what we think is a realistic number. And we're still forecasting 436 million, uh, which would result in about a 600,000 increase for MTS. And so we typically end up using the budget that Sandag publishes, which tends to be a little more conservative. So we're not actually changing the forecast uh, for this item, but we did want to just share that we don't have any major concerns on the sales tax front. Um, and if anything, we should get slightly good news at this point. Uh, the other sales tax revenue we receive is TDA. Uh, so for this one, we submit a claim every year in the beginning of the year, and we receive that funding no matter what. If cash receipts come in higher um, than budget, then the excess revenue goes into a reserve at the county. And if cash receipts come in lower, 
um, then we draw from that reserve. And so we're kept whole no matter what. And so we do not have a, a reason at this time to amend the claim that was submitted. And so we're not uh, projecting any changes. And those cash receipts are actually tracking pretty closely so far to budget. So no concerns on that side either. STA or state transit assistance, that is one of our formula funds that is a uh, sales tax on diesel fuel. Um, so the original budget was 39.4 million based on the January projection provided by the state. Uh, since then, we received a August revise from the state and are now projecting 40.4 million, which is an increase of about 1.1 million. Um, the actual amount we receive, we won't know until May. And so, and they're all over the place in terms of whether that forecast is accurate. So we're not putting too much weight in that, but at this time we don't have any concerns on the STA side. Um, any excess would go into capital most likely anyways. Um, so no change, but could be good news at the end of the year. Uh, Senate Bill 125 funding. So this has been a topic of discussion for a while, so everyone's pretty familiar with it, but that's the $4 billion in state funding that's being distributed to transit agencies through the TIRCP program. Um, it's a formula fund based on population. Uh, this can fund either operations or capital, but it must meet specific criteria for increasing service, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, serving disadvantaged communities, et cetera. Uh, we're receiving 284 million of that over multiple fiscal years. And so for the FY24 operating budget, we specifically need to include 3 million for our IRIS rapid operations. And then we're also including one and a half million uh, for security enhancements, which is the additional security staff that was approved by the board a few months ago. And so here's a summary table of the revenues. Uh, so operating revenues, which is passenger revenue and mostly interest is increasing by 2.7 million or 2.7%. Our subsidy revenue is increasing by 4.4 million and that's mostly the addition of the SB 125 one-time funding. Um, and so our total revenues are projected to increase by 7.2 million or 1.8%. So moving on to our expense forecast. So first we'll look at personnel. Uh, so for wages, we're projecting an increase of 1.3 million from the original budget. And this is just reflecting the additional security staff that we're hiring. Uh, so the board approved 54 total positions and we plan to have 45 of those hired by the end of the fiscal year at various times. And so we turned that hiring schedule into a dollar forecast and that's what we came up with. Uh, we're increasing the forecast for pension costs by 519000 um, That's mostly within trolley, and it's the CalPERS management payment. We're able to fine-tune that figure based on the run rate so far and the actual invoices that we're receiving. And then health and welfare. So we've been trending fairly unfavorable uh, in San Diego Transit premiums and deductions. That was uh, where we dissolved the ATU and IBEW trust a couple of years ago. And um, for a time, those excess trust funds uh, were still being used to cover employee deductions and whatnot. Those trust funds are now uh, completely dissolved and used. So we have a much better picture um, of what the actual premiums and deductions are. And so we're increasing um, the budget there to reflect that. Another piece is that uh, we typically budget a five to 10% increase in, in agency-wide uh, healthcare premiums. Um, we had included a 10% increase to be effective in January of this year in the original budget, um, but we now have uh, premium data for most of the plans and they're actually increasing closer to 12 to 13% um, depending on the plan. And so when we combine our adjustments for both those things, we're um, increasing the health and welfare budget by about 942,000. Workers' compensation costs. Um, so if you look at the chart to the right, you can see FY23 uh, was extremely high uh, based on uh, the recent trend. Uh, we had a very expensive case that was settled at the end of last year. So for FY24, the original budget, we kept it still fairly high, um, close to FY22 levels. And so far we've been trending a little unfavorable at about 160,000 unfavorable through September. 
And so for the forecast, we're keeping the unfavorable experience that we saw in the first quarter, but we're not projecting it to continue for the rest of the year. And that's where we think that we can get close to budget for the remainder of the year. And then lastly, in personnel, we have cost recovery. So we're decreasing that forecast by 144,000. And that's um, just tightening up the forecast for our NCTD reimbursement for their regional share of the uh, fare system costs. And then we've also been doing um, our flagging reimbursement has been higher than projected in the original budget as well. And so both those result in a in slight increase there. And so overall personnel for is forecasted to increase by about 3.1 million or 1.8% in total in this forecast. So next we have our outside services and the biggest category by far is purchase transportation there and that's our fixed route and paratransit contracts. Uh, so on the fixed route side, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we had reduced service in FY23 due to staffing shortages. We planned on adding most of that back in January of this year, um, but uh, we are now reducing our service levels by about 1% from the original draft, and that's just clawing back some of the planned increases that we don't think we can 100% plan on um, to restore as the driver shortage still continues to be somewhat of an issue. Uh, and then on the paratransit side, we just tightened up the demand forecast on that side. It's actually pretty close this year, um, and we're forecasting a slight reduction of about 111K there at this time. Um, other outside services, so we're bumping up repair and maintenance costs by 56,000. Um, engines and transmission overhauls, we've had a favorable experience so far, and we're projecting about 100,000 in savings there. And then general outside services, we're projecting a decrease of about a million dollars, and that's due to the Pronto regional expenses. Um, it's, it's a pretty complicated regional sharing model that we have, and some of the expenses that we were building into the budget are actually being paid directly by North County, and so it's really a tightening up of that and a better understanding of that sharing. Um, and then lastly, we have outsides or outside services in total are increasing by about 2.4 million. Materials and supplies. So typically the big drivers for this line are revenue vehicle parts, as well as equipment maintenance supplies that they use in operations. Uh, those items are trending pretty close to budget so far, so we're not making any adjustments there. Uh, we are including 540,000 for security equipment though, related to the new staffing. Um, and so we, our materials and supplies overall are increasing by 540,000. Uh, next, we have the energy budget. So the big drivers here are electricity and CNG. Uh, so on the electricity side, commodity rates are trending uh, slightly higher than what we forecasted originally. And for the year, we're projecting a 5.7% increase over what we had budgeted. And that equates to about a million dollar increase in the overall budget for electricity. On the CNG side, uh, commodity rates actually been very close to what we budgeted so far at 152 versus a budget of 153. Uh, we are projecting a slight increase in consumption, just tightening up that uh, our consumption levels, even with that slight reduction in service. We were just a little off on those uh, calculations. Um, and so we're not adjusting the forecast uh, for CNG at this time because those two things are kind of canceling each other out. Um, so energy overall is projected to increase by about a million dollars, and that's all electricity. Risk management, so we've been 386,000 so far through September. Um, we had some large recoveries. Uh, we've also been trending favorable on some of the claim payouts. And then the bigger one is we've been trending favorable on legal expenses. And so the risk budget, um, we can, that your experience can flip fairly fast with a large claim. Um, so we're not carrying that forward, but we do want to reflect that favorable experience so far in this forecast. And so we are decreasing those expenses by 386,000. So uh, expenses overall are increasing by about 1.9 million or about a half a percent. And then so when we look at revenues and expenses combined, so our operating revenues are increasing by 2.7 million. That's really the interest revenue partially offset by the decrease in fare revenue. 
uh, recurring subsidies decreasing by 80,000. That's our Medi-Cal revenue. We're bringing down slightly based on the trend. Uh, so our recurring revenues are increasing by about 2.7 million or 0.7%. Uh, our expenses are forecasted to increase by about 1.9 million. Um, so our structural deficit, so our recurring revenues and expenses uh, is coming down slightly by about 800,000 uh, in this forecast. And then when we add back in the one-time funds, we have the uh, federal stimulus funding where we're drawing 85 million based on all of our eligible expenses. About 34 million of that is gonna be excess. Um, so it will be contributed to the operating deficit reserve. And then you add in the one-time SB 125 funding, uh, four and a half million. And so with those items added back in, we're projecting uh, excess revenues over expenses of about 5.3 million for uh, this forecast. And then a quick update on the stimulus fund. So we have 360 million in total. Uh, we've drawn 244 million to date. Uh, so we have 116 million left that haven't been claimed yet or drawn yet. Um, and between the stimulus funds and the SB 125 funds, uh, we are still projecting that the structural deficit is going to be balanced through FY 28. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Clerk, do we have any public comments? We have no public comments, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, this is an informational item, and I will take it up to our committee members. Do any committee members wish to comment? or ask any questions. Hearing none, uh, this is an informational item, so no motion is needed. Thank you so much again, Gordon, for your report. Um, and we're gonna move on to item number six, which is the next meeting date. And our next meeting is to be determined. Uh, so we will move on to item number seven. Um, are there, is there any other staff or committee member communication? Uh, at this time, hearing none, uh, we will move on to item number eight, which is our adjournment. Uh, thank you all for your attendance and input today. Uh, the meeting of the MTS Budget Development Committee is now officially adjourned. And everybody have a wonderful rest of your day.